My name is Steve Manal. I'm the director of the College of Sustainability here at Dalhousie. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Environment, Sustainability and Society lecture. Um, two things I wanted to uh, mention to begin with. First is, um, for those of you who aren't students uh, and who've been coming to this lecture regularly, next week is study week, so there is no lecture. The second thing, uh, more seriously, is I want to acknowledge that we are on unceded Mi'kmaq territory and that we are all treaty people, uh, and uh, this is the spirit in which we should be gathered here today. Uh, this evening, we're pleased to collaborate with one of our longtime partners in the Environment, Sustainability, and Society lectures, and that's the Marine and Environmental Law Institute of the uh, Schulich School of Law. And I'm um, pleased to introduce Camille Cameron, the dean of the Schulich School of Law, who will tell us a bit about the law school, the program, and about the Douglas Johnston lecture. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, as Steve said, my name is Camille Cameron. I'm the dean of the Schulich School of Law, and it's a pleasure to be able also to uh, extend a welcome to you all to this lecture. Um, we're pleased that we are able, the Schulich School of Law and the College of Sustainability, to collaborate on this venture. I think it's the ninth um, year for this particular Douglas Johnson lecture. And when there's a lecture named for someone, I think it's important to say a little bit about the namesake, and I will tell you then just a bit about who the person was after whom the lecture is named. Um, it's named in the memory of Doug Johnson, who for many years was a professor at law at Dalhousie Law School and then um, at the University of Victoria. Uh, he was a leading teacher, scholar, and writer in international marine and environmental law. He published num numerous scholarly works on environmental law, international fisheries law, ocean boundary delimitation, treaty law, and the history of international law. His works include a number of authored, co-authored, edited, and co-edited books on the topics I've just mentioned. I've got a list of them here, but it's long, and I'm not going to repeat them. Um, but it is quite an impressive list. Um, his numerous contributions to the law school included the development of a marine and environmental law program in the 1970s. We're very proud of that program. Um, it's one of our flagship programs, and it was the first of its kind in the country. Um, in addition to doing that, he also strengthened uh, our graduate program and generally contributed to the scholarly reputation of the law school. The last book he wrote received a posthumous award of merit from the American Society of International Law. Um, I didn't know him, but I'm told he was a mentor and a friend to many generations of law students and other researchers, and his name certainly is well known um, in the field of marine and um, uh, environmental and international law. Um, he had a particular passion about the Arctic region, the place of the Arctic region, and its peoples in international law. And so I think it's fair to say that he would be quite impressed with the choice of the speaker um, for this evening. And on that note, and to introduce the speaker, I'll now turn things back to Steve. There you go. Thank you. So it is my uh, honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Mary Simon. Mary was born in an Inuit village with a population of less than 1,000 in Nunavik in northern Quebec. She began her work as a producer for CBC North before she began a career in public service. And it's a very long and uh, busy career. It sometimes gets, it's daunting to read the accomplishments and efforts. She was one of the senior Inuit negotiators during the repatriation of the Canadian Constitution. In 1984, she was appointed by then Prime Minister Jean Chrétien to be the first Canadian ambassador for circumpolar affairs. And this was a post she held for a decade. Subsequently, she took the lead negotiating role in the creation of an eight country council known today as the Arctic Council. She's also held the position of the Canadian ambassador to Denmark. She chaired the NAFTA Commission on Environmental Cooperation and has served as the Chancellor of Trent University in Peterborough. She's received many international honors, including the Order of Canada, the National Order of Quebec, the National Aboriginal Achievement Award, and the Gold Medal of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. She holds honorary doctorates of law uh, degrees from no fewer than five universities, and most recently published a new shared Arctic leadership report with recommendations on education, infrastructure, and environmental protection in Canada's Arctic. It's our very great honor to have Mary with us. Please join me in welcoming Mary Simon tonight. Am I on? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. 
Unusakut, Nakumik, Takunga Hai Hoya Simagama, Takua Ilinati, Amisutakani, Tohoviaka. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation to come and for your kind introduction. Um, I'm really honored that uh, there are so many young students um, amongst the audience. Not to say that the others aren't as important, but I just wanted to uh, say that the younger generation today um, is, uh, is very engaged in many ways, and it's, it's, it's really encouraging to see so many of you here tonight. Um, first, I, I just want to thank um, Dalhousie University, um, especially the ESS program, uh, and the Marine and Environmental Law Institute for the invitation to speak here tonight. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of, of a distinguished list of speakers invited for the Douglas M. Johnson Lecture Series. And as you pointed out, um, Douglas Johnson was a leader in the field of public policy and social and environmental justice. Uh, so public policy and, and social and environmental justice have shadowed me during my entire life, adult life. Even as a little girl um, living in a small village in Nunavik, I was directly impacted by decisions around education, uh, poli education policy made in Ottawa and as you know, as you probably can see, and I'll talk a bit about my family uh, later when I talk about my uh, personal life for a few minutes so that you know who I am. Um, but just on the education side, um, the reason I said I was impacted uh, as, uh, at an early age and it probably had an impact on me uh, as an adult was uh, we could only go to school up to grade six in our community. And even there, even though it was not a residential school, it was the federal day schools, we weren't allowed to speak our language um, in, our, in the school, in our community. So that was a very strange experience uh, to go through um, as well. But w the, the big impact that that it had on me was when my father, after grade six, went to the federal day agent and um, put in, you know, the oral application to continue our education. Um, and because my mother married a white man, uh, we were denied that education. And. Um, the Indian Act was not supposed to apply to Inuit because we don't live on reserves. But at the same time, federal agents, um, when they, I guess, thought it merited the, a decision, would uh, sometimes uh, make these kind of negative decisions that had a, a serious impact on families. And uh, we happened to be one of those fa large families. Well, there was eight siblings, and um, I, had, I have seven siblings. And uh, I was homeschooled by my father. My father homeschooled us and got us through, through high school. And uh, he must have been a very determined man because <laughs> he had to order, order the correspondence courses from, from Alberta. And, and then, you know, we would go to school and then he would have to send uh, our completed courses out back to Alberta to get through the uh, accreditation system, in, especially when we were going through high school. So that's what I mean by being impacted at a very early age uh, when I was growing up, because it didn't just happen to, to me or my family, it happened to, to others in different ways. Um, and when I was a young adult, um, I was also asked by elders 
uh, to explain policy issues that were being negotiated into land claims agreements. Um, this, and this was one of those life-changing um, experiences for me because it introduced me to the consequences of policy and the dynamics of a negotiating table. Um, like when you're a small group with very little resources and you walk into a room in Ottawa or in Montreal or anywhere else in southern Canada, um, you walk into a room where you are facing many people on the other side of the table, namely, um, uh, you know, government, government representatives, and also uh, developers, because they were also involved in the, in the negotiations. So these were like very quick, we had to learn very quickly <laughs> without real, any real experience. And it was always based on um, what we were taught by our, our elders, that these were the positions that we had to take no matter what we were negotiating, that certain fundamental issues would, ha would not, we would not let them go. And that's what we did, was we, 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 fought, we fought a hard, hard battle, but in the end, uh, we agreed to uh, these agreements uh, in good faith. A lot of it was vague. Um, a lot of the provisions in the land claims agreements are quite vague. And sometimes when you go and implement those provisions with governments, they tend to interpret them in very legalistic ways so that the good faith and the um, honor in which we felt we negotiated these agreements are sometimes lost in, in further discussions uh, with, with other authorities. So it, it's, it's a continuing process. It, it, just because we settled our land claims agreements uh, doesn't mean that we don't have continuing uh, issues and continuing negotiations. And the negotiations are ongoing uh, all the time, whether it's um, making sure that implementation is taking place or how we are setting up our public governments, like the Nunavut government. Those discussions are ongoing, and um, it's a process that's in place that hopefully will improve as time goes on because we take on more and more responsibilities. Um, so therefore, you know, in Inuit life, we always feel that these um, agreements are living documents, that they're not agreements that were static. In, for instance, in 1975, when we settled the land claims agreement in northern Quebec, um, that was in 1975 um, situation in terms of development issues. Now, when you look at the region now in 2017, there's been great changes in the region. Um, Hydro-Quebec has developed many more um, resources and ongoing discussions are going on with the Inuit of Nunavik for the uh, resource development. Uh, so these things are, are always ongoing. And as an Inuk leader, uh, I, saw, I have sat across from, uh, from ministers and, and prime ministers to bring forward a point of view of those living in the Arctic who would directly be impi impacted by this Arctic policy uh, that is, you know, sometimes uh, made in Ottawa even now without our full involvement. So I am here tonight to talk about this personal journey of mine and to, to explain my perspective on why Arctic policy needs our national attention. I also want to share with you the conversation, uh, conversations I had last year with Arctic leaders when, at the request of Minister Bennett, 
I travel to a co communities throughout the Arctic to hear their assessment and where we are today as an Arctic nation. I'll go back to that uh, report uh, after, but first I, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, my family because it is part of uh, the life that I continue to lead. And uh, this is the region where I come from. I come from Kujuak. Uh, I was born, uh, uh, first of all, I was born in Kangaksualujuak. That's a very long uh, <laughs> name for a community. But uh, I was born there and then I, I, I was raised, I, I, the family made Kujuak our home community, so we moved when I was about five years old. Um, so, next. So this is uh, a picture of, uh, of uh, my family. Uh, some of my siblings on the left side, uh, my grandmother in the middle, and I'm there on the left with the scarf around her head. <laughs> and we're proudly showing off a seal that, uh, that my father was going to um, prepare for, for our food. So it was a, a very happy moment. And uh, there is my father, who, was, uh, who went to the Arctic when he was 19 years old. He uh, passed away on Remembrance Day in 2009, and he was 91 years old. So he never left the Arctic. And uh, he embraced my mother's uh, culture completely and wholeheartedly and, and spoke fluently several dialects of Inutijut, because he, he lived in different parts of the Arctic. And, and uh, when he was 19, 20, he was up in Arctic Bay, and he was the Hudson Bay Post uh, fur trader. He was a fur trader uh, uh, from, from Manitoba, from Sandy Lake, uh, near Winnipeg. And um, when he was on Arctic Bay, he learned to speak the language very quickly. And in those days, when people like my father went to the Arctic, they became not just the fur trader, but they became the postmaster, the doctor <laughs> that gave uh, the uh, injections for some epidemics that, you know, that were happening, such as measles. Um, they became sort of the RCMP representative, although they didn't um, uh, do what the RCMP people do, but kept track of what was happening uh, in the community, and uh, I think he was a great northerner. <laughs> um, and this is a, 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 a picture of uh, one of the federal, uh, the uh, residential schools up in, I think it might have been in Chester, uh, oh, Aklavik. This is an Aklavik uh, picture in 1930. And these are some of the um, residential school students that were taken from their families to, to go to school. Um, and as you probably have heard many stories about what happened in Canada with the residential schools. Um, so I won't go into a lot of deep uh, discussion about that. If you want later, you can ask questions. But I did want to talk about two words that in our language that are very significant. Um, and I used to hear these words when I was uh, a, a young per, uh, child or, or when I was a young person. Ilra uh, and Kapea. They were used by Inuit to describe the combination of, uh, of fear, respect, uh, and a kind of a nervous apprehension uh, that, that uh, they felt about uh, southerners that came into the north, um, and uh, these feelings kind of permeated our our lives all the time. Uh, and I remember, I remember the feeling. Even today, I can actually feel it when I talk about Ilira uh, and Kapia. So um, 
it wasn't that people were against anybody, they just didn't know what was going to happen. And the, you know, because the relationship wasn't developed in any way, um, when people were ordered to do something, they felt some fear and apprehension about what was happening. So um, I'm not talking about this to, to, to say in any way that, that uh, there was anything negative. It was just the, the, the feeling of the relationship that was, that was, that was present. Um, so, uh, oh, where are the words? Oh, <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> so the, this is the, the uh, has anybody ever seen this? No. So this is something that's been developed a lot by the, uh, the school in Ottawa. It's a special school that's been developed for Nunavut students that uh, finish high school and want to go to, to continue their education to learn about uh, Nunavut and the land claims agreements. So this is, this is a, a model that shows the pre-contact with uh, southern uh, people and uh, how the relationship developed with explorers, the whalers, the missionaries, and the traders. And then after that, relationship, the government uh, era came into play, and uh, the federal government started to establish uh, the Canadian justice system, which Inuit were not very familiar with. Uh, the military, certain posts were made um, military sites, like Kudruk was a military site, Iqaluit was a mil military site. Um, and then there was uh, the forced, we call them forced relocations because um, there were families from the region I come from, uh, Inujuak, uh, that were moved up to the high Arctic into what is now called uh, Resolute Bay and Greece Fjord. And those people are originally from northern Quebec. And with no supplies, no real planning at all, they were moved by ship into, the no into those northern uh, regions. Um, and in fact, they didn't, I, I, was, I facilitated and co-chaired an inquiry into those relocations for the, for the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples some years ago in the 90s. And, uh, the elders that spoke at that inquiry uh, told us that because they come from northern Quebec where we have small trees and vegetation, they brought their wood stoves and their, t and their tents. And they were put on shore by the ship and they were left to, to, to their own devices. But they found out that there was no wood uh, to make a fire, because in the high Arctic there is no wood except drift. If you get wood, it's driftwood. Um, and they had to survive basically uh, on their own. They also didn't know that the sun uh, was gone for, from November to, uh, to February, because in Nunavik, it, doesn't, it actually doesn't go all the way down. It, it's a very short day but it doesn't go all the way down. So they, they didn't know that it actually went dark for several months. So these are things that, that people dealt with, but you know, they were very, it's unbelievable how people can survive those kind of situations. But Inuit were very, um, they survived those elements. Um, and they survived those elements in their own, own communities as well. Um, but they were more prepared because they were used to their region. They, were, they knew where they could hunt. They knew where they could fish. 
so they were used to the, the, the area that, that, they, that they come from, so the hardship wasn't the same. It was completely different. Uh, but they still survived, and now we have two very thriving communities in the high Arctic that help assert Canadian sovereignty. And, uh, you know, I think we're very proud. Uh, Inuit are very proud Canadians. Uh, they, they think very highly of Canada as a country, and they feel they're an integral part of Canada, and therefore we fight for the same level of acknowledgement, the same level of services as other Canadians. We are also taxpayers, just like other Canadians, uh, because we don't live on reserves. I mean, the relationship for First Nations is different, uh, and in its own way, it works for, um, although First Nations say there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed, uh, but in our case, we don't have a reserve system uh, so we therefore don't um, have the same relationship with, with the federal government. Um, so then uh, you go into, uh, I think I, think I uh, like there's the, the, the issue of the dog killings, uh, there's the movement of people into communities because the, the government wanted the children to go to school. And the attraction was the family allowance check. People didn't have a lot of money, right? So when they were offered a family allowance check, if they sent their kids to school, I think a lot of people did agree to do that because they could buy some food, they could buy some things that they really needed in their, in their home. Uh, so these were some of the attractions that were, that were set out to ensure that Inuit were moved into community settings. Um, and then there's also very different stories about the, the dogs being killed after they were moved into communities so that they would not be able to go out, out on the land. Um, and then after that, you know, they started to, to create communities that, that were uh, involved in, in having a say about what was going on in their communities. And part of that movement was through the co-ops. The cooperative movement was one of the early um, organizations that came to the North that started to work with Inuit in terms of their ability to uh, you know, carve, they carved beautiful car stone carvings. Uh, they, their printmaking was, was very, very good. Some people became famous because they were so good, as you know. And uh, so Inuit started to be involved in the, in the movement of, of making the communities more, more uh, sociably inviting to our own people that lived in that community. And uh, the leaders decided that one of the things that we had to do was to create a national organization so that Inuit that live across the Arctic in four regions uh, had one voice uh, nationally. So this was something that was formed in uh, 1971. And uh, that was really the beginning of uh, of the discussions about uh, having uh, uh, negotiations for settling the land that was outstanding and development was pressuring governments to settle these claims so that, uh, the, so that development could proceed. Uh, so these negotiations began in uh, the early 70s and the first agreement that was signed was the um, James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement. Uh, I couldn't remember the name for a minute there. Uh, the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement that was signed in 1975. 
And that's where I was talking about earlier, about going into rooms where, you know, you had all these people on one side of the room and four or five of us on the other side and, and tr negotiating these very big issues and difficult issues that, that somehow, you know, the Inuit leaders got through all of this and uh, here we are today, <laughs> you know, <laughs> things, things move ahead. Uh, not that there aren't problems, but we are still, you know, moving forward. Um, and things will get better. And that's, uh, I'm an optimist, so that no matter what happens, that what, that's what I always believe in. Um, so we had the new land claims agreements. Then we decided we needed an international voice because there were Inuit that lived in Greenland a substantial number, mostly the island of Greenland, was made up of Inuit. Um, and, uh, and then there was the Inuit in Alaska. There was a, a lot of Inuit living in Alaska. And in fact, it was a leader from uh, Alaska, from the North Slope Borough, Eben Hobson, uh, that first brought everyone together in 1977. I was a f very young uh, person at that time, and I remember going to Point Barrow, Alaska, to be, to be involved in this international meeting with Inuit from three different countries. And to this day, I can remember the joy of how people felt when they got together as one people. It was, it was absolutely amazing. But we always had an empty seat because our brothers and sisters from Russia were not involved. We couldn't get them involved at that point. But when I became president in 1986, yeah, 1986, that's a long time ago, um, one of the first things that, that we did uh, the ICC Council was to start discussions with the Russian government to get the Inuit of Russia in Chukotka involved in, uh, in the organization. And it took us uh, um, many years, uh, from 1986 to 1992. 1992, they came to the uh, ICC General Assembly in, uh, in uh, Inuvik, and they participated for the first time. But when I went to Russia, I went to Chukotka twice in, in 86 and 87. And uh, even, uh, perestroika hadn't really started yet, so it was still very much uh, a country that was not open to dialogue with other other peoples or other uh, countries at that level, at the indigenous peoples level, even then it was very difficult to get in. But we finally got the approval to go in. Uh, and, but of course, we had authorities with us all the time. Uh, we could not really have any meetings without the authorities being present. And that was in 1986, 87. Um, but we did. We had meetings. They were all very cordial, and uh, we didn't make a fuss about them being involved. Uh, we just talked together. And I always like to tell this little story, short story. One of the council members for the ICC was from Alaska, and he was from when the Iron Curtain went down. There were two islands that Little Diomede and Big Diomede, and families lived in both islands. And they went back and forth by boat and by dog team um, and shared, you know, families hunting together. And when the Iron Curtain went down, within 24 hours, they had no contact. So this council member that sat on ICC with me came with me on this trip. And he hadn't seen his cousins or his relatives for 40 years. So he was a young guy, like a, uh, I guess a young teenager, when, or a young boy when this happened. 
And uh, he brought his niece with him, that was a young person. And uh, when we got to um, Anadir, he got off the plane and he saw these people and he recognized his, his cousins right away, even though he hadn't seen them for 40 years. And they started talking together in, in, in Upiak, in Upiak, Yupik, which is the language that they speak there. They, were, they, they hadn't lost any of it. And it was just amazing to see. It was so, so inspiring. And uh, <coughs> I, I always remember that, that, that story. So, and then we got in back into Canada, we did the constitutional negotiations. And uh, as you know, we have uh, some recognition in the Constitution uh, as um, Aboriginal peoples in Canada with uh, distinct rights. Uh, and that was a, a long fought battle. <laughs> um, and, you know, one little word may not mean very much to us in a, on a day-to-day -day basis, but when, but when you're negotiating the constitutional, constitutional rights, there must be lawyers and law students in this room, one little word can break a negotiation. And I don't know, a few times, like we were right on the verge of, of breaking off everything, and somehow we kept it all together, and uh, had agreement with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, and the provinces, and the federal government. And uh, those rights that are in the Constitution are very few in words, but they took a long time to, to achieve. So um, they're, they're, it's a very meaningful, meaningful um, recognition because in uh, 1894 or 1896, uh, the Constitution called us savages. <laughs> the term they used in that constitutional uh, document called us, uh, for a better word, they called us savages because I guess because we lived out on the land. Um, anyway, that's all changed for the better. and. Uh, and then we had all these different land claims agreements in the Nunavut and Inuvialuit. Uh, the IBC, the Broadcasting Corporation, was, was established at that time as well. And then uh, the creation of Nunavut, the, the government. Uh, it, was, um, w it was agreed to at the same time as the land claims agreement. So when the creation of Nunavut happened, uh, or the land claims agreement was signed, we created, the Inuit and the Canadian people created a new territory and changed the landscape of Canada. And that was a, a, a very significant constitutional change in, in, Canada's, uh, um, in, uh, in Canada as a country uh, because we had to make sure that that the laws and the constitution of the Nunavut territory was consistent with Canadian law. So all these, you know, these were very significant uh, milestones in uh, not just in Inuit history, but in, in Canada's history as well. Um, and then, uh, uh, so now what we're at, is the devolution. Nunavut is in, is in a period of negotiating further rights within the government um, to take more authority over different issues that are under the authority of the federal government right now. And there's a, a lot of different issues I'm not like intricately involved in the negotiations. So I, I can't tell you exactly what is being negotiated now, but uh, devolution has, did start, and um, that's the objective, is to reach some kind of an agreement that would allow 
the Nunavut government to achieve more authority over, over different issues that it did not have at the creation of the territory. Um, and and this, that's how they did it in Greenland as well. They, they, they got more authority as time went on when, when the... Um, when people were able to, you know, take on take on more uh, governance issues uh, and more ability to govern uh, the territory, so that's that's what that's what's going on. So that's that's kind of like um, the the story in a in a little nutshell. <laughs> so I don't know how long I've been talking. What time is it? Oh, okay. okay. So I've already talked about this um, the, when we created the ICC. So you can pass that. Um, I did that as well, so you can pass that. Um, so that's the, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau signing the Constitution Act of 1982 with the Queen uh, when the Constitution was repatriated from... Uh, from England to Canada uh, in 1982. So um, I talked about Section 35, uh, the, the rights of Aboriginal <coughs> people. And you know, when I was talking about a word making, um, sorry, I, I touched this. Uh, when I was saying a word makes a significant difference in a negotiation, the word existing was the word. Without that, we couldn't reach an agreement. They had, they had to have that word. That, that's the story of the Constitution, Section 35, is the word existing. And it, it does give some limitations when you, when you really put it into you know, discussing law and, uh, and Aboriginal rights how far back they go, you know, the, whether the Section 35 is, a, is either a full box theory or a half full glass, or is it an empty box? So those, you know, the courts have, have now decided that it's more of a full box than an empty box, so um, some of the court decisions have come out in favor. Of, of Aboriginal rights, but it's always a challenge to go to court. You never know how it's going to go. So uh, those are decisions that have to be made by leaders. Um, and then remember Elijah Harper? Anybody remember Elijah Harper? Yeah, Meech Lake. Meech Lake was negotiated uh, without recognizing any Aboriginal rights. And that was after Section 35. So we, we were going to lose the whole thing, be, and Elijah Har Harper had the one vote. He could kill it, and he did. He, I mean, people, Canadians, a lot of Canadians weren't, weren't very happy, but in the end, we had to do what we had to do. It was not against anyone's rights, but to be excluded from a significant document like the Meech Lake Accord was enough for Elijah Harper to vote no. And that's going to be in the history books, I hope. Okay, uh, so uh, I thought maybe I'd talk about my report for a few minutes, which is the one I've recently uh, done. Uh, I don't know if Louis, Louis, are you here? Louis? No, I, I guess he's away. I worked with a young guy um, and some other people that, um, that I won't name in particular, but I give them significant, I, I recognize the significant role this very small team played in, in this report, um, but Louis was one of them. He, he's the guy that traveled with me across the Arctic 
And uh, it was a very uh, challenging appointment. And it was based on the joint um, declaration that was signed by Obama and uh, Trudeau. And with that declaration, they decided to appoint a special representative <coughs> for Minister Bennett to see how they could implement this declaration. And the main thrust of, uh, so I was asked if I would do this, and I agreed to do it because I felt it was, it was significant. Um, and uh, one of the things, one of the main things that I had to do was to talk to northerners, northerners living in the Arctic, not just ind indigenous people, but all northerners. So we consulted uh, from Labrador, Newfoundland, all the way to Whitehorse in the Yukon. And we heard some very, very significant stories that weren't necessarily new to me, but I had to hear them from leaders in the North to be able to write them out because it wasn't, the, the report was not about me giving an opinion on the state of the Arctic, it was a report based on the findings of our consultations. But it made it easier for someone like me to do it because I had been involved in northern development and northern political development for some 40 years. So it, it made it easier for, for me to, to, to know like how to engage uh, people and what kind of questions I had to put forward to, to northerners on different issues. So my report addresses um, many key issues from education and language, um, research and indigenous knowledge, uh, closing the infrastructure gap, including the digital divide that we have, um, housing, uh, reducing fossil fuel dependency, because at, at the same time that we're talking about climate change, we still depend 100% on fuel for our energy in our communities. Even though a lot of development has taken place, we still depend on that uh, entirely for for our diesel engines, for our community, community energy. Um, so the option of looking at alternatives uh, was one of, the, one of the things that I had to look into. And um, I also had to continue the conservation discussion. One of the key findings that we made was, was that indigenous northerners really wanted to have protected areas, indigenous protected areas that could be different from uh, national parks or from other protected areas because there are not hardly, there are no protected areas in the marine except now with Lancaster Sound. Uh, we have a, a, a national park um, in, the, in the Lancaster Sound, but we don't have it anywhere else. Uh, but Nunatsiavut is actively discussing uh, a protected uh, area in the marine, um, in the ocean. So uh, that was one of the things that, that I had to uh, discuss with, with northerners. And um, what I found when I was consulting uh, people was that every single meeting that I went to or every single person that I spoke to always talked about how, how important education was. But education in the context of creating something that was meaningful and people could identify with as, a, as an Aboriginal person, which meant 
that we would we need to develop education that uses Inuktitut as a teaching language or another indigenous language in the north, and that we needed to develop curriculum to be able to teach in the Inuktitut language beyond grade four. Like right now, we can teach Inuktitut up to grade four, but after that, it's, uh, it's English or French. Um, but the objective is to create a new um, education system that includes the use of our own language as a teaching language and to develop curriculum that is, that is also based on, on uh, the North and, and uh, not just on the people, but the, the North and the Arctic itself. Um, An education, we decided when we were writing the report, we decided that we had to frame the report uh, in a way that put education as the cornerstone of all the issues that, that people spoke to me about. Because if we had a good education system and we had better educated individuals, the workforce would change, the dynamics of, of job opportunities would change. Um, so education sort of became the cornerstone of the whole report. And um, I won't go into a lot of detail on it, but I think if anybody is interested in reading it, it's not very long. Uh, I, I didn't want to uh, publish a long report uh, because I find that when I get these thick documents, you know, you read the first, I don't know, 10 pages or so, and then you sort of go to the end and read the end. So I thought, well, why not do a report that will allow people to read right through it? So I also did the report in a narrative um, in, in a more narrative way, not just in terms of these are the issues, but more in a style that, that starts from a beginning and sort of ends in a way that is both um, very stark in its, in its uh, language when it comes to the different issues that are touching our people on a day-to-day -day basis, because as much as we have made progress on all those issues that I talked about, constitutional development, recognition in, uh, you know, creating land claims agreements, having an international organization, and the list goes on. But we are still faced with kind of an insurmountable problem in our communities. The social infrastructure, the social well-being, mental health issues can continue to be issues that, that dominate some of our discussions in the North. And I, like when we were doing the report, we, saw, we, can't, we asked ourselves, why is this happening? Despite all these things that we've achieved, why are we still in this state? And uh, the report tells you why. And it's because of all those other things that have happened historically where we continue to have severe impacts on our social, um, mental health capacity. The impact was so great that intergenerational trauma was passed on to people's children, like violence in the family, um, violence against women. Now we have uh, not just suicides, but we have some murder cases happening. And that happens in every society, but when we look at a very small group of people in a large region, 
it's very like stark. Um, so this, the report tells you, I think, why we continue to have those issues. And I end my report with mental health. Because until we can address the mental health issue that is facing our communities and the social problems that con continue to face our communities, um, the education uh, the, the level of education that will be achieved is still low because if you're not well, you're not going to want to go to school. You're, not, you're going to drop out at, in grade 9 or grade 10. That's really sort of the uh, level when kids drop out of school up north. Um, and then there's no service to help people with some of the problems they're having mentally. And that, and that can be traced back to, to, to these issues that, uh, that, that I talked about. Uh, so, I'm, I'm almost out of time. Um, so I just want to end my talk on, on, uh, with a few words on reconciliation. Because that's been a pretty... Um, Pretty hard, uh, pretty, uh, you can, I think we're done with the, oh, you don't want to see that. <laughs> if we think small, our actions will be small. That's, I think, I think that's true. <laughs> okay, so I just want to end my talk uh, by talking a little bit about reconciliation in the context of Arctic policy. Um, you know, like, as I talk tonight, I think you could sense that, that we are aware, or maybe even fully aware, um, that we all face nation-building nation uh, questions, not just Indigenous people, but other Canadians also face nation-building questions. And... Um, my generation of Inuit, as I outlined tonight, was the generation of Inuit who left our homes on the land and moved into communities throughout Canada's Arctic and began the decades of long work of, of, of building institutions and uh, implementing the land claims agreements. So your generation, a lot of young people are here, uh, your generation, I think... Um, on nation building, and I am speaking to the students here tonight, will take many paths. But we are certain about one of these paths. Your generation will need to move forward um, on reconciliation with Canada's First Peoples. My own uh, personal view on, on, uh, is that reconciliation doesn't fall to our leaders. It is also our responsibility as individuals to help make the kind of positive changes that we aspire to as people living in a great country like Canada. Reconciliation is about seeing things differently than the narrative most Canadians know about Aboriginal people. Reconciliation is about making changes in power relationships. And I think that is why uh, the work on a new Arctic policy is, is so important. As the great 19th century social activist Frederick Douglass once said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. So I'm looking at to you, to your generation, to advance the struggle on reconciliation, to move our country forward, make the journey easier and the destination closer, support the building of new partnerships between Inuit, First Nations, Métis, and other Canadians in your home, in your communities, 
in the organizations that you work in now or will work in soon. If we all do that, our country, we will all be richer for it. So thank you very much tonight. And if you have any questions. Thank you so much. So we do have time for questions. We'll start with a couple of questions from students and then open it up to everyone. Uh, questions for Mary. So the question uh, suggests, the questioner suggests that she knows a bit about problems of transparency in negotiating policy with indigenous communities and are you finding in these new efforts that transparency is still a problem for moving forward with policy in the north? Yes, it, it continues to be a problem. I think uh, it has changed. Um, there is more engagement with leaders uh, at, a, at a political level, but then the, those political agreements that are made, when they filter down into uh, the policy side and the development side in the implementation side of what is agreed to, oftentimes the, the transparency isn't there. So it continues to be an issue for indigenous people. So the question, um, the questioner is interested in some of the profound social issues you were talking about at the end of the talk. Uh, so domestic violence, um, suicides and others. Um, and wondering about what institutions are established to deal with those. Is there a need for different kinds of institutions to deal with those things? Is that an important part of the, the process moving forward? Yes, very much so. It's a big part of it. Uh, right now, like when you hear about the suicide rates in the Arctic, which are considered to be the highest in Canada, um, we don't have like we don't have mental health services. There's, um, except if you live in a in a big town like Iqaluit. The, the, there is very little service. So we need um, a lot of training for our own people to be able to provide those services. And then institu or institutions or organizations to support those uh, services, uh, the infrastructure is greatly lacking. Uh, so I think that uh, like right now, when somebody is, you know, has attempted suicide, they, they're taken to the nursing station or to the small hospital, and they just allow them to stay in the hospital for three days until they calm down, and they let them go home, and that's, that's the support they get. Um, so it's, it's, it's not, it's very insufficient. Uh, the incarceration rate has gone way up, so the, so the uh, jails are overcrowded. Um, like the men's uh, pr prison in Iqaluit recently, there was an article uh, in the Nunatsiak News that said that you know the, the, it was so overcrowded that you know like ten people being in the same room uh, kind of situation, and uh, that kind of support to engage um, people that can start to help uh, people that are in jail for petty petty offenses. They need support to get out of that system as well um, and to engage them back into, into being productive uh, people in their own community. That doesn't just happen on its own a lot of the time. I think, you know, the support 
uh, is done through a process of you know, bringing people out once they've served their sentence and providing some support to help them engage back into their community. Those, unless you're in a place like Iqaluit, in the communities, it's, it's pretty much non-existent. Just how, how important do you think uh, these kind of shared and transferring uh, authority models apply to things like social services as well as governance? Because in your graph of Inuit uh, history, you look at this uh, increase in Inuit authority mm -hmm. over their own lives. Uh, so in an emergency like a, a healthcare emergency or a mental health emergency, it would be tempting to sort of somehow try and throw resources at it, but it, does, it seems to be really important that that be done from within. Yeah, it doesn't always work just by throwing money into mm -hmm. the community. If the infrastructure and the training hasn't been done, right. like training and building a place where people can go shouldn't happen when there's a crisis. Right. It should happen before, and the services should be available before somebody goes into crisis. So the planning of the healthcare system, for instance, should mm -hmm. include that, and perhaps in the negotiations they are doing that. I'm not, like right. I said, intricately involved in the negotiations, so I can't say that that's in or out uh, in the, of the discussions, but. It is. It should. It should be an integral part. Okay. Uh, questions from anyone? Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the questioner observes that the Circumpolar Conference tries to recognize a kind of singular Inuit nation that spans four different countries, at the same time as those four countries are increasingly squabbling over the resources under the Arctic seabed. Um, is there a potential for? Uh, conflict between Inuit and their the, the the sort of recognized nations when those recognized nations begin to have conflict over resource. Uh, between sort of Inuit, question? I'm not sure, but um, there certainly is uh, a potential for conflict. Uh, but we don't call ourselves a nation within the circumpolar countries. Uh, that discussion has never really taken place like we are a nation within a nation within different nations um, but we are part of the Arctic Council which I didn't talk about um, indigenous people the international organized six international indigenous organizations are part of the Arctic Council as permanent participants which allows them to participate in the ministerial meetings with foreign ministers when they meet every two years, and then they're involved in all the working groups, in all the senior officials' meetings. Um, so that status, which has never um, been realized in other forums, gives, allows indigenous people to participate in those talks. So that's a forum, that's one forum that, that potentially has the power to discuss those issues. And so in Militarization is not one of them. That's, not, that's off, the sub, off the agenda. We had to take that off the agenda because we already have a forum for military, military activity, although we argued that um, military activity can create environmental degradation or environmental issues and therefore the Arctic Council should be able to discuss those issues. Um, but I think that discussion has been reignited in the Arctic Council and uh, hopefully they can deal with it because the, pro the pollution in the Arctic Ocean from military activity is, if you really read some of the reports that have been done by researchers and so on, 
it's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's quite scary up in the, up in the high Arctic. Uh, so Inuit in the four countries like Alaska, Canada, Greenland, uh, Russia's not really involved in it right now because their government stopped, prohibited them from being participants again uh, just a few couple of years ago. Um, but the Inuit of Canada, Greenland, and Alaska have formed the, a commission that wants to make the, you know, the open polynia in the Arctic Ocean where the whales and all the mammals go and feed throughout the winter. It's a big open area and it's, it's an open polynia. And the work that they're doing right now is to, to create that as an international uh, protected area. So those discussions, their report is coming out soon and uh, hopefully that will help in the negotiations. Okay. So those are some of the things that are happening. Okay. So the questioner is speaking to the importance of local knowledge and local engagement in education mm -hmm. and wondering to what extent is local knowledge and knowledge of the local part of Inuit education and if it's there, what's that like? We had quite a few Inuit teachers in Nunavut at one point. Um, and they were very engaged in the education of, of um, students and making sure that, um, that local knowledge was integrated into the system. But over time, so a lot, some of these teachers have moved on to other jobs because other jobs paid better, other jobs had better equality in terms of, of, of uh, parity, uh, wage parity, um, and uh, the education system, unfortunately, I don't think pays enough for the teachers that teach in the North. Uh, maybe the teachers get a lot of benefits, I don't know, but I think that for Inuit teachers to move on and take on other jobs because uh, it was more financially feasible for them, uh, then we need to look at how we are, um, how we are addressing the, the teachers, teachers in the North. So there are local teachers and they teach they teach up to grade four. That's where the problem starts, is the local knowledge and the curriculum development has happened up to grade four to an extent. It's still not the level. It's not an equal level all the way. It should be standardized, but it's there. But after grade four, we don't have a lot of Inuit teachers that can continue to teach let's say grade five, six, or seven, except maybe a few, like maybe there's a handful, but there, that's not enough. That doesn't engage nearly enough teachers. Uh, uh, so we need a lot more training, Inuit, uh, training for Inuit teachers to be able to teach in our language, and that's, that's part of the challenge is to, is if we want to teach as a language of instruction, then we need to have Inuit teachers to do it. <laughs> so that's, that's part of the challenge as well. Mm -hmm. so, so if I could summarize the, the comments for the audience. So you're, you're recognizing from another forum involving Master Mariners and Coast Guard that there's a recognition that when dealing with these issues, the very first principle is to develop a a principle around partnership, around inclusion, around Inuit and other indigenous persons being at the table at the level of principle, not served by or subservient to. Great. So the Coast Guard representative said, right, in the coming, the next season, we're going to instruct the captains of our Coast Guard icebreakers to when they get into a port or an area where there's a community, bring the elders aboard, let them sit down treat them like right. equals, that sort of thing, and try to get them, get their confidence in the southern world up there. Right. Okay. 
so, so we can share the outcome of that, that seminar then was an encouragement that captains of Coast Guard vessels would bring elders aboard, treat them as partners and guests and, guests and reciprocal hospitality. Right. Well, if you had a coach guard, you were saying that the Canadian coach guard, they bring these, you know, some of these people have knowledge like you wouldn't believe right. uh, about the area, about the weather, and everything. And so we should be using that, right. but treat them with respect and give them some recommendation, right. kind of recommendation. Okay. Sure. Thanks for that. So the last uh, comment I'll, I'll reflect back to the audience was that uh, one of the incentives for Canadian Coast Guard to yeah. engage in this was that the U.S. Coast Guard is already doing it and drawing on that Indigenous knowledge. Um, great. We have one more question because my voice is about to give out. Uh, did you see a question? What has happened to your report since it was submitted and what do you hope will happen from that report? I hope that the implementations that are in the report, there's quite a few, and it, you know they range from different issues that I talked about. Um, I'd like to see how the government will implement those agreements. Is there any watchdog? Is there anyone to push the... Minister Bennett. The report was for, I did the report for her, and once my report was submitted, I was, I, I, I completed my, um, my assignment immediately after, although I thought it could have been a bit longer because then I could have probably done some um, discussions with ministers and so on about the recommendations. Uh, but I didn't have any control over that, so uh, the idea in the report is not just to explain that the issues are out there and need addressing, we actually made recommendations in the report. Now, some of them are, we're discussing some of them, like the University of the Arctic. There's, uh, there's, go there's discussions going on right now that we hope will start to move it ahead um, and we recently had a round table in uh, Peterborough in, at Trent University, and um, the round table asked ITK, the national organization, to take the lead on it, which they've agreed to do. So, but I say this without really knowing how it's going to work out, you know, like I don't. I don't have a handle on that, uh, and I don't have a specific role other than having co-chaired the roundtable after my report to discuss my recommendation. And then, you know, there's a lot of other recommendations in the report that I don't think are, are being addressed right now. Although I have heard from Northern leaders on numerous occasions that the report is being used by the federal government as a foundational document for the Arctic policy development that they're doing right now, that they're engaged in. So hopefully, <laughs> you know, it, it has served some purpose, uh, but the objective is to, to have those discussions uh, both with northern leaders and territorial governments to see how, how specifically those recommendations can be dealt with. Although, you know, the government always points out that they are implementing those recommendations, like the Arctic University, some of the education stuff they say they're implementing. So they, there, there are ways of looking at the report and looking at ways the governments are discussing with northern leaders, and they can show that they are actually involved in, in discussing those issues, not necessarily the recommendation itself, but the issues, and uh, trying to figure out ways to, to advance. 
but I can't be specific, uh, more specific than that. Maybe but one I don't, thing. I don't know. Maybe one thing that we can all do, since the reports seem to be awfully short from that table of contents, is we could all read it and know what it says, and ask yeah, you our can elected read it officials in, about what's been done. Less than an hour. On the on the internet, uh, government of Canada website, INAC. Uh, Indi indigenous and Northern Affairs. So, yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll, get a, we'll get a web link on the ESS Lecture Series website too. So with that, I'd like to, uh, for all to join me in thanking Mary Simon for a really wonderful presentation. Thank you.